So uh, with that, we should move on to our next speaker. Sarah says he'll be quite as an assistant secretary to Leicester and District Trade Union Council. It's a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, I'm going to say, um, as has just been said, I'm Sarah. I'm from the Trade Union Council, which is the group of body, the group of unions that meet together to try and work together to solve problems that we all share a common interest in. And I'm particularly interested in equalities. So I'm speaking with that hat on, but I'm also a union member for Leicester University College Union, um, working at the University of Leicester. So occasionally I might mention a bit of that, and obviously I'm just an individual as well. So if I go off on any personal rants, just tell me to stop. Um, I am only 30 years old, so theoretically we've solved everything within my lifetime and we shouldn't actually be needing to even discuss these things right now, so I'm, I'm quite shocked to hear we haven't solved it yet. Um, I'm gonna, before I start my presentation, I'm just going to caveat it. I have a maths degree. Um, I mention this for two reasons. I like statistics, so there's quite a few of them in what I've got to say, because I really think that sometimes statistics actually are quite powerful things and important things to hear but also just because the story of how I actually went to do my maths degree is one of the few instances, thankfully, in my life I've experienced discrimination. When I was at, uni when I was at school 16 years ago, picking my A-levels, I decided I wanted to do maths and further maths. The school told me I couldn't do that because no girl had ever done that before, and they basically didn't know what to do with me. Um, I told them that yes, I was, and that made me all the more determined. To be honest, that's basically the only reason I went to university to do a mathematics degree, just to prove my maths teachers wrong. They let me do it, I was in a class of six where the other five were boys and they managed perfectly fine with me. They occasionally talked about football and things that I didn't care about, but other than that we got along just fine. Um, it's already been mentioned this evening about diversity in this area of Leicester and you know, I've, I've grown up in Leicester, I now live one mile down the road but I grew up in Wigston and Narborough Road's always been one of these places that I've absolutely loved my whole life. Um, I'm sure you don't need to be told this but it's good to be reminded. There's 12,000 people that lived here, live here. And I think that one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of Narva Road is the world in a street. I just think it sums it up. You know, as you walk down Narva Road, you see everything you can imagine. And that's why I love this area of Leicester so much. I love coming here, wandering around, deciding whether I want to eat Turkish tonight or Lebanese, as we've been doing this evening. Never had that before, so that was nice. And there's lots of wonderful things down this one street. There's apparently 222 shops here that represent 22 countries. I mean, where else in the world are you going to find a place as diverse as that? It's absolutely incredible. And the other description I like of it is, here everyone's a minority, and here is a community of communities. And I think that sums this area up really nicely. There's no one group that really owns this part of Leicester or this part of this city. It's a community that belongs to all the communities here. But, having said that, this is an area that's not without its difficulties, so it's diverse and it's wonderful and it needs to be celebrated, but with that comes other problems. There's been so little government investment here, there's been so little local authority investment over the years, and the investment that has come has come from the wonderful, diverse migrant population we've got here and from the local business people. And what's ended up happening is that, unfortunately, this is also one of the most deprived areas of the UK. And that's through no fault of any of the hard-working people who live here, but through the lack of investment that's given here. I think it was summed up by, I'm not sure who just said, but you can look at Narborough Road and it's exactly the same as it was in the 1970s. That's wonderful, but that's also not good. That means that it's not receiving the investment that it needs to do up the buildings and make it look nice and keep it up to date. So in Leicester, just to give you some more statistics, 18% of people are on benefits compared with 14% in the rest of England. Now that's not to say that Leicester people are not hard-working people, not that they're lazier than the rest of the country. When I tell you this, this is because they're quite probably on benefits because even with their jobs and their hard work and they're still struggling to make ends meet, so they're still needing additional help. So this isn't the people that don't work at all, this is people that need additional help even though they're working very hard to make ends meet. So, in, when we had a census in 2011, we saw that about 29% of people in Leicester haven't got qualifications, compared with 23% of England. And again, this just demonstrates that we have a massive divide in this city compared to other places in the UK. So few people here actually own their own homes and mortgages. People are renting and putting money into, sorry, into landlords, but not actually owning their own homes in a way that they do in other areas of the country. But the Leicester population is younger as well, so that might be some of it. And there's more people working age here than anywhere else in the country. So, um, 
Just to mention a, a couple of things that Leicester and District Trade Union Council believe about this. I mean, we think one of the ways that may be a way to reduce poverty is by introducing some kind of maximum income. Now, I know this is a controversial thing, but the idea of this is that perhaps we could re replace a cap on earnings. What was found, which I, and I find this horrifying, in a recent Oxfam report, they found that eight billionaires own half um, the world's wealth. I mean, that's just, that's absolutely astounding. These people don't, they don't need that kind of money. There's people here in this own city that earn more money than what they know what to do with when we've got people who can scarcely make their meat, ends meet, probably in this very room. I'm sure there's people here that struggle from day to day to be able to pay their rent, to buy their food. And then we've got other people that have more money than they could ever dream of. So at the other extreme, I'm sure most of you know about the idea of the living wage. We, should, we support that quite strongly. So there is a national living wage that's been introduced by the government, and this is um, £7.50 for anyone over 25. But um, they call this the living wage, but actually it's a little bit confusing because there's also a foundation called the Living Wage Foundation. They actually recommend that you need more than that to live. They recommend that you actually need £8.75 an hour, so over a pound more an hour to actually make ends meet. Um, we've got about 21% of people that don't receive this wage. And when you actually calculate this, I mean, £8.75 an hour, it doesn't work out at a lot a year. It's still going to be difficult. This is the bare minimum that you need to pay your bills, to pay your rent. This isn't a lavish lifestyle that you're going to be leading if you're paid this. So that's something that we really believe quite strongly in, is that people need to be paid enough to live. Hopefully that would be enough in this part of the country. Obviously, if you live in London, £8.75 an hour is really not going to go very far. Um, it's more like £10.75 an hour when you're in an area like that. Um, a, an area really close to my heart, and for any of you who know me will know that I could talk all night about this, is homelessness. And when we get to the real extreme end of poverty, um, I was appalled to hear that 3,739 households approached Leicester City Council last year because they were homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. You've only got to take a walk down Narva Road to see the people that are sleeping rough and that are homeless on the street. I mean, I just think this is absolutely shocking and appalling. And this is something that goes across all ethnic groups, all sexualities, all races, or ev everything. It's something that should be everybody's business. I make it my business to hassle the council about this quite regularly, and I really think this is something that lots of us can work on together, really. I just think it's absolutely appalling in a country like this that we're still struggling with something like homelessness. I I'm gonna stop with that, because I could honestly talk for the entire night just about that one thing. So I'll go, I'll go back to diversity a bit more. Um, so I um, help organise our Equalities Committee in the Leicester and District Trade Union Council. And you know we're really proud to stand with anyone that needs our support and we'll support people of, of all diverse backgrounds. We've recently um, relaunched our Equalities Committee and I had the difficult task of trying to come up with three priorities we wanted to focus on. And that's not to say that we're not interested in engaging in other things, but that we wanted something over the next 12 months to focus on initially. Um, we were interested in tackling the gender pay gap, um, which is known to exist locally and nationally. Um, this has already briefly been mentioned, and I know some of us have been talking about this over refreshments earlier. I mean, my own employer, the University of Leicester, was found to be one of the ten worst universities for um, discrepancy between men and women. This is a difficult one to solve. However, we have had 42 years um, since the Equal Pay Act to have got a bit of a grip on it. Um, I, I appreciate that it's difficult and perhaps it requires a bit more long-term thought, but I really hope it doesn't take another 42 years to solve this one. We need to get, get a move on with it now. Um, we um, are keen to support LGBT activities in Leicester, particularly Leicester Pride. We were really concerned this year that Leicester Pride wasn't going to happen. We didn't know what to do. Um, unfortunately, we aren't cash rich, so we couldn't pump up, pump up the money to make Leicester Pride work. But thankfully, um, it did happen in the end. But this is something we're very keen to support. The reason we've chosen the LGBT community, and particularly Leicester Pride, is because the LGBT community cuts across everything else. It doesn't know ethnic group, it doesn't know gender, it doesn't know anything else at all. It's, it's something that crosses us all and affects us all. Um, and finally, the other thing we were interested in from an equalities perspective, and again, this has been mentioned briefly, was about ensuring a safe and welcoming workplace for everybody. Now, um, 
Health and safety has a bit of a bad reputation, to be honest, and um, it is not the best term, health and safety. Um, however, our health and safety officer believes very passionately in well-being in the workplace, health in the workplace, and other things as well. And I think it's really important that we have workplaces that are inclusive for everybody, um, especially these big public sector like universities. There's no reason why they can't be completely accessible to everybody, why they can't hire a diverse workforce across the board. So we selected these areas because we thought they represented both equality and diversity, but as I said, they're not the only things we're focusing on. This is just, this is just the next 12 months. So I really wish I could solve all those things in the next 12 months. Um, and I, I've already just mentioned the LGBT community. I mean, one of the things that we've been working to do recently is I've been talking to the LGBT centre down on Wellington Street about how best we can work together, about how we can promote each other's causes. I think Leicester's a wonderful example of the LGBT community. Um, I remember I read, it, I read in the news, and I'm sure many of you read in the news, that Leicester reported this summer the first interfaith lesbian wedding. And um, it was between a Hindu woman and her Jewish partner in a Hindu ceremony. And I thought it just demonstrated perfectly that love is love. And it's as simple as that. It doesn't need to know race, it doesn't need to know religion, it doesn't need to know anything. If you love someone, you love someone. It's that simple. And I, I was really proud um, that that had taken place in, in my city. And um, it was, I, think, I hope other people were proud when they saw that as well. Um, I've mentioned again that, um, I'll just mention again, I'm, I don't want to steal other people's thunder, uh, thunder obviously is the 50th anniversary year of the partial decriminalisation of homosexuality, and this is part of the reason why I'm so keen to work more with LGBT communities. I'm just going to mention a couple of other campaigns and then I'll stop, but um, in my own union, Leicester University College Union, we were quite proud to support a campaign for One Day Without Us. I'm not sure how many other people came across this this year. So, the idea of this campaign was to celebrate the role of the migrant workforce. And what we did was, it wasn't just Leicester, it was a national campaign, but it was something that was done in Leicester and it will come again next year for people who are interested. We were trying to highlight the importance that migrant populations have within our workforces. So we held a ceremonial strike. The people who were of migrant populations um, walked out of work to, we had a bit of a party in the middle of the university square. Um, but we also did some, well some groups did some very powerful things where for example they took photographs of their research group and then they took photographs again with the migrant populations removed to try and demonstrate actually what a massive impact the migrant population has. Um, this was um, at the university but there's no reason why it can't be further than that and I think it's a really good example of demonstrating the diversity of our workforces. It's one of these cities greatest strengths but um, I'm, I've been concerned and I'm sure other people have been concerned that um, there were some uh, figures that came out this week about net migration and it's showing a fall for the first time since the referendum and worryingly we're seeing quite a lot of EU citizens emigrating and our workforce relies so much on migrant populations, the NHS, the universities and many other workforces as well rely a great deal on those people that we're potentially losing. So um, that organisation is going to be help, holding more events in February 2018 so it's worth keeping an eye out for that. There'll be um, communal dinners and um, meetings to discuss things very similarly to this. I'm going to try and resist going off on one, but the last thing I want to mention is obviously worldwide, I feel like we're living in a world that is potentially more diverse than ever. I, I fear we're not going to get through this evening without mentioning Donald Trump, so I'm going to put it out there right now. Um, our, our union and many other unions have spoke out a great deal about his travel ban, which is the thing I want to briefly mention. I think this is the most, dis I personally think this is the most disgusting, hate-filled piece of legislation that any um, person has really tried to put out in recent uh, history. However, he's probably going to outdo himself, so um, I don't want to say that that's the worst he's going to do. Um, I just feel that this sends a message that people are not welcome and I truly hope that we don't have anything like that here because, well, other than that EU referendum, but I won't go off on one about that, but um, what he did made people feel incredibly unwelcome, made it clear that they were unwelcome, and I completely condemn everything he did. And um, the Trades Council spoke out and we wrote to the press and we did several other things to um, say how much we completely and utterly didn't agree with what he'd done there. So um, I have actually personally been reasonably fortunate in my life to not be on the receiving end of too much discrimination. 
Um, the few instances I have had um, are, are mainly from women, which generally surprises people, but women actually can be very sexist towards other women. I only mention that as a don't, don't forget that um, discrimination doesn't always come in the forms that you expect it to always come in. Sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's very quiet. The actual outrageous comments, um, are, in my experience, are rarer and rarer, but the subtle undermining is becoming perhaps more and more common and that kind of um, discrimination that goes under the radar. But events like this help restore my faith in humanity. I hope they restore your faith in humanity, that there are decent people out there, and hopefully it will take less than another 42 years for us to achieve an equal world that is diverse and wonderful as well. Okay, thanks for I'd like to make a comment, and uh, it might be just up as I to say that I've come from um, a music class tonight, and uh, I'm left-handed. It's this point that you made about things being subtle, and it's your point about being brave, I would even suggest audacious. So I've come from a music class where I've been learning to play the viola left-handed which I think is brave and audacious. But I've been bullied as a result of that by the leader of the orchestra. Because no one in an orchestra ever plays a violin, a stringed instrument, as a left-hander. So I've been hauled in front of the orchestra tonight, last week. And I've been signaled out and said, this is Les, and this is the person who wants to play left-handed in our orchestra. What do the orchestra say? And they said, right on, man. <laughs> the point I'm making is your point, and your point, and everyone's point, to combat it, you need to be brave. But it's more than brave, it's audacious. You need to have the freedom and the latitude and the safety to be brave. Mine's a daft little example, but nevertheless, it's salutary and it's an illustration of how diversity isn't just the normal kind of stuff we're talking about. And more importantly for me, I've traveled over a million miles in my lifetime mostly in Africa, in China, in Southeast Asia. Burstall, I've even been to Burstall. <laughs> that, that's going beyond, isn't it? And the beauty, and beauty is the right word of diversity, is the creativity and imagination and flair, elan, a clap, whatever word you want to use. That's what diversity brings. It brings you the opportunity to solve problems creatively. <laughs> and everything you say, you know, you don't want token inclusion. You want an understanding of how diversity benefits everyone. <coughs> Not just in the workplace, but in what I do now. I'll maybe say more about that, if you go to the creative side, you might have to shut me up about that. But it's about living a creative and imaginative, a flair included life. And that's why I try and embed in the stuff that I do. Because I'm an old git. <laughs> um, and the only way I can do it, I don't work. I vaguely remember what it means a long time ago. But what I do is to embed diversity into all the creative stuff that I do with kids, youngsters, so that they understand how drawing upon all this huge amount of flair and imagination and originality makes the, the world. I do it through music and, and dance and drama, <coughs> stuff like that, but it makes the world a better place. And surely, surely, isn't that the way that we can do it? Start young so that you understand 
that all these things that are drawn from all this rich amount of creativity that's worldwide actually benefits us all. And that's one of the things that I'm proud that we do probably better than anywhere else in the world. We do it here in Leicester. And it's through our creativity. I might say more about this. Thank you. Set here. I just want to make one comment, something which I think we overrate diversity in Leicester as being the most diverse place in the world. And it's something that I think is not helpful anymore. I think actually when I moved to Leicester, I mean it was the seventh country I was going to live in permanently. That is, and I come, I'm, my hometown, although I was not born there, I was not even born in that country, but my hometown I consider these days Rotterdam. It is really more diverse than Leicester. But then, what, why I wanted to say, and the other thing is we are in Europe. So if we speak about a European comes here, then actually that is already where I think is one of the big problems what we are dealing with. As, as an example of how we are excluding that thing. We in Britain, and I am, I'm from here now. If anybody asks me, where are you from? I said, I'm from Leicester, can't you hear? You don't have an accent. I don't understand that totally. Because it's a, we, we, we make ourselves of being so special, so different. And that is the problem. We, we share so much around. So, sorry, I'm a bit, there are just certain things that I am, Sometimes I think it's not helpful. When I moved to this part, I lived long in London. Then I moved five years away, come back and moved to Leicester. I loved Leicester, but I hated at times as well. And some of these things, but coming here, if you understand diversity of a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds, with a lot of different ways when you eat, when you stand up, how you. Then Leicester, until I would say 10, 15, not that diverse. It was, we had, it was not that we had one particular, <coughs> but if you go to places, and Leicester is moving more like that, and therefore we also see certain more complications, that we, be, that we have people from all over, and people with all kinds of ideas and lifestyles, and, 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 and then things become real kind of diverse. So, um, yes, we are a diverse city, but let's keep a bit of modesty in it as well, that we have also so much to learn from other places in the world. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs>